Today, I'm pleased to introduce today's session, Building a Gen AI App End-to-End -end with Ruby, and our guest speaker, Andre Bondarev. Andre has been a software engineering professional for almost 13 years. Among many others, he's been fortunate to make his impact at Spree Commerce, Wedding Wire, Fiscal Note, National Public Radio, and USA Today. He currently runs a software development firm and serves as an architect, engineering manager, and fractional CTO um, on client projects. In his free time, he enjoys playing tennis and going on long runs while listening to podcasts. Uh, Andre is also joined by my colleague, Eugen Tang, a developer advocate here at Zillis. Welcome, Andre and Eugen. Thank you for that warm welcome, Emily. Um, so hello, everybody. Thanks for coming on today. We're going to be talking about generative AI and Ruby. And so uh, first, I'm going to let Andre introduce himself. Hey, how are you? I'm Andre. Um, Ruby has been my tool of choice for uh, over a decade. Um, and I've been actively thinking um, that we ought to have uh, a, uh, a AI solution uh, to address the uh, growing amount of needs in that space. Um, and I'm here to uh, talk about that today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andre. And also that little QR code, if you have your phone, you can pull it out. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds here to do scan the QR code and that QR code will send you to Andre's LinkedIn and you can connect with him on there and ask him uh, questions about Ruby. Okay. Oh. So my name is Eugen. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at Zillis. Um, I've worked at companies like IBM and Amazon. I've worked on auto ML stuff. I've published research papers and I'm big into machine learning things. And so I work on a lot of generative AI and how you can build LLM apps um, using uh, the new CVP stack, using a chat GPT, which is a, uh, or a chat GPT like LLM and a vector database and prompt as code. Uh, and just like Andre, I also have a QR code there on the right side of your screen and you can scan that and you can find me on LinkedIn. Okay, so let's get today's session started. Uh, oh, wait, one more slide. Okay, one more slide. We're talking about Zillis. Uh, Zillis is a vector database. Uh, Zillis is an unstructured data platform. Milvis is our open source uh, vector database. And you can see our LinkedIn and our Twitter, as well as where you can go join the Milvis Slack and check out the Milvis GitHub. Um, yeah, so Milvis is the open source vector database. Zillis is the cloud managed version, um, which we also have a free tier for that you should check out. Okay, so let's cover today's... Uh, Agenda. Today, we're going to start with introduction to generative AI. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, neural networks and vector embeddings and vector search and how uh, things are kind of looking right now in generative AI. Then we're going to go into generative AI with Ruby, where Andre is going to take over and he's going to talk about uh, Ruby and generative AI and why these two, you know, why, why it matters. Uh, then we'll talk about Milvis with Ruby. So Andre made the... Um, Ruby SDK for Milvis, and uh, we'll cover a little bit about the Milvis architecture. I'll cover a little bit about the Milvis architecture, and then Andre will tell you about um, the Milvis SDK. And then uh, Langchain.rb, or Langchain for Ruby, is Andre's uh, other project, which is Langchain, uh, but for Ruby. And he'll talk to you about that and show you some really cool um, demos. Okay, so let's get started with this introduction to uh, generative AI. Okay, so we're going to start by just thinking about the amount of data that's out there. So basically, every corporation runs on data, everyone runs on data, and most of that data is unstructured data. So IDC estimates that there's going to be 175 zettabytes of data globally, with 80% of that being unstructured, and 90% of that unstructured data never being touched. And unstructured data comes in many forms, texts, images, videos, PDFs, CSVs, all of these things are counted as unstructured data. And the reason is because unstructured data is basically any data that doesn't fit your predefined data model. And so how do you work with unstructured data? You gotta use vector embeddings. The way that you are able to actually interact with and work with your unstructured data is you take your documents, um, you put it into a embedding model. And so that works, the way that works is you choose a uh, fit corresponding deep learning models so if you're working with images, you probably want ResNet 50. If you're working with uh, sentences, you probably want sentence transformers. And then you cut off the last layer. You cut off the last layer of your model so you can get the vector embedding. The vector embedding is the output from the second to last layer, right? Because the last layer is usually some sort of classification and prediction or something like that. 
And so that output gives you vector and you put those vectors into a vector database such as Milvis or uh, Zillis. And you are able to query and interact with your unstructured data once it's in a vector database. Um, so let's take a little bit of look at what are these vector embeddings, right? I've just said, you know, how do you work with unstructured data? You put them into vector embeddings. But what is an actual vector embedding? Uh, here I'm going to show you a toy example of a vector embedding. So these are four examples of um, two-dimensional vectors. And you will never work with two-dimensional vectors in real life, but this is an illustrative example, right? So let's start by looking at queen. Um, so queen here is represented by 0.3 comma 0.9. And king is represented by 0.5 comma 0.7. And woman is represented by 0.3 comma 0.4. And man is represented by 0.5 comma 0.2. What I want to draw your attention to here is that woman and queen start with the same uh, you know, x value, I guess. And king and man start with the same x value. And what this tells you is that along this axis, along the x axis, these words are similar and these words are similar. Um, and you can also see the difference here along the y-axis between woman and man is 0.2 as the same between king, queen and king. So what vector embeddings allow us to do is they allow us to do math on these kinds of words. So we'll start with uh, this example here. If you start with queen, you have 0.3 comma 0.9, and you subtract woman, then you are left with zero here and uh, comma 0.5. So with zero comma 0.5, you add man, then you get 0.5 comma, points, which is the word king. So the whole idea behind this slide is just to illustrate the idea that you can do math on words using vector embeddings. So things are generated, like I said before, they're generated from the second to last layer. So this is what a neural network kind of looks like um, representationally, right? You input some data, and then it goes through a bunch of hidden layers and there's a ton of calculations being done. And typically there's an output layer and the output layer is some sort of classification or prediction or regression or something like that. And um, what a vector embedding is, is all the information that goes to classifying what that input uh, should output, right? So that's how you know that this is the semantic uh, meaning behind um, this input because it's, it's, it's gonna be interpreted by the output to give you some sort of classification. Uh, this is just a screenshot from Zillis to give you an idea of what um, vector embeddings are and what they look like, right? So the important thing here is to look at this title vector here, right? You see how these vectors are all like, you know, these float values and there's like a lot of them and they can be negative, but, um, or positive. Um, so yeah, vector embeddings are basically this long, long string of numbers. Uh, so where can vector databases help? Some use cases, some like real life use cases are um, listed here. Um, basically, you know, similarity search is really the uh, the abstraction that goes across all of these images, videos, audio, text, DNA, you know, whether or not something is out of place, right? Anomaly detection is really just similarity search with a different point of view. Um, so yeah, these are some things that vector databases, vector databases are helpful for. And the way that similarity search works is essentially you take your unstructured data and you transform it into some sort of vectors. And then once you transform it into a vector, you save that vector embedding into your vector database, such as Milvis. And when you need to uh, query, you perform a query, you take that unstructured data that you had before and you put it into a vector embedding, uh, into the same vector embedding model, uh, typically the same vectors embeddings model. You can actually use a different one, but you'll have slightly different semantic meanings. Um, and uh, one thing, if you do want to use a different one, I don't suggest it, but if you do want to use a different one, you have to make sure that it has the same number of dimensions. Once you have your new vector embedding, you query against the vector database and it performs an approximate nearest neighbor search and you get some results. And that's kind of how you find, you know, what are the most similar vectors to my uh, input? What are the most similar data to my input? So an example, of a generative AI use case of vector databases and LLMs and, you know, uh, this new CVP stack. Um, the example that we're going to look at here is saying like, hey, like, let's say you uh, are a company or you work at a company and you have hundreds of thousands of maybe millions of pages of documentation that your uh, users, that your customers, your staff, your, uh, you know, software engineers, they use this kind of um, data that you, they need to have this documentation. Um, you can either have people search it, which takes a long, long time. Um, this was definitely what my experience at Amazon was like, 
Or you can create an internal chatbot using the CBP stack, right? ChatGPT like LLM, a vector database, and some sort of prompt. And you can talk to your um, data that way. So that's a really good use case of generative AI and vector databases. And now we're going to talk about generative AI with Ruby, and I'm going to hand it off to Andre to um, share his screen. Thank you. Oh, all right. So let's talk about generative AI with Ruby. Um, so I run a small software development company called Source Labs. Uh, so we help uh, our clients bring amazing software products to market. Um, and we're obviously doing a lot of uh, AI work now. So why Ruby? Um, obviously, Python is kind of a leader in the space um, because it has it's so popular in the academic setting, in the research setting. Um, Ruby is very similar. It's also uh, built in C. It has a lot of kind of similar issues, um, same problems with concurrency, very similar syntax. Um, and um, Ruby and Rails are still very popular. There's still a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, brand new products and existing products that are built in Ruby um, uh, on Ruby on Rails. Um, and um, subjectively, I think Rails is uh, one of the best ways to, to build web services. Um, I find that the community has this healthy amount of pragmatism when it comes to building uh, tools. Uh, they tend to not reinvent the wheel. Um, and then it's also very, very conducive to the monolith application stru uh, structure architecture um, in this kind of environment of um, economic stagnation or contraction, depending on who you ask. Uh, companies are looking at their expenses and they're looking to cut costs um, in uh, many different areas. And simplifying your application architecture is one of them. Um, so as opposed to running, uh, uh, running an array of microservices and that brings, um, that brings your cost up and it's, uh, a lot more complex, um, as opposed to, um, running a single monolith, for example. So also in this, uh, in this, uh, diagram below that I borrowed from, um, a very good blog post called the rise of, uh, of an AI engineer. You could see that a lot of the traditional full stack engineers on the right hand side are getting a little bit closer to this API boundary. And now they um, need to be much more familiar with ML, AI, LLM concepts such as chains, agents, and the associated tooling and the infrastructure. Um, so, uh, and the, the language here really kind of doesn't matter whether it's Python or Ruby. Um, so uh, we're trying to build a set of uh, tools in Ruby so that uh, the full stack engineers can can um, use these um, APIs. And uh, let's talk about Milvis with Ruby. Um, and now Eugen is going to explain us what what Milvis actually is. Yeah, um, great explanation for the the AI engineer stuff and why people need to understand what's going on with LLM ops, Andre. Um, so Milvis and Ruby is one tool that you can use uh, that's in Ruby that will help you build these LLM apps. Um, the architecture of Milvis is cloud native, distributed system native, so it's pretty complex. Um, but I'm going to try to cover it in a high level. And if you have uh, more questions, please uh, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll answer them to the best of our abilities. Uh, so with Milvis, you start with um, you know hitting some sort of SDK, such as the Ruby SDK. And from there, we kind of like route your queries um, into the worker nodes. And so this is really the, uh, there's really a couple important things that I want to point out here. And so one is that you see these three kind of nodes under worker nodes. One is query node, one is data node, and one is index node. And the reason why we have these three different nodes is because actually querying, ingesting data, and indexing are three different separations of concerns when it comes to working with a vector database or any database really. Um, and so what this allows us to do is this allows us to dynamically scale depending on the kind of um, the kind of uh, uh, workload that you have, the kind of workload that you need. Um, and another thing that is really, really cool, and this one like when I was when I, when I was when this was first explained to me, this like blew my mind. Um, Milvis puts ve creates vector indexes over 512 megabyte chunks 
or segments, uh, sorry, segments is what we call them. Um, and then when at query time, it is able to parallel query all of these segments and return a response based on that parallel query. And so you can imagine that as you grow your data size, so for example, at a hundred uh, gigabytes, you're gonna be doing a lot more querying. If you're, you're gonna be doing a lot more computation if you're gonna go through all hundred gigabytes of this, uh, in sequence, as opposed to in parallel searching 512 megabytes segments and then uh, coagulate or getting everything together at the end. Um, so that's one, these are like two really cool things um, about Milvis that make it really scalable and uh, makes it really unique. Um, so yeah, Andre, uh, you know, I'm going to hand it off to you to talk about the Ruby aspect of the Ruby SDK. Thank you. So if you decide to try out Milvis, um, we think you should. Um, we have a Ruby API client uh, and you can find it um, at that link right there. Um, it is one of the popular options for uh uh, building a vector search. Um, it's a convenient wrapper in Ruby on top of Milvus. Um, it's part of the link chain or B stack. Um, and it supports um, managing your Milvus uh, database. So you can create collections, indices, uh, add or remove data, search query, and managing uh, and manage partitions. Uh, so let's let's jump into what uh, link chain RB is. Uh, so it's inspired by the original uh, Python slash TypeScript implementation. Um, again, I felt like we ought to have a solution in the in the Ruby world, and 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 I kind of dove in and starting building this uh, link chain RV project. So it's it's an orchestration layer for building LLM based applications. Uh, it's for stringing multiple uh, types of systems together. So vector search databases, uh, LLMs, um, uh, your various data stores, uh, and kind of auxiliary services around that. Uh, some of the use cases that we target is semantic search, vector search, uh, QA over documents, chat bots, and, and the uh, experimental agents. Uh, and it's also, uh, it presents the developer with the best practices. Uh, it encapsulates uh, kind of the best approach for building applications with LLMs. Some of the uh, vanity metrics here, uh, it's only about uh, three months old. Uh, there's about uh, 480 stars, 30 contributors and growing. And we also have a Discord server. Um, some of the features uh, we have within LinkChain RB is prompt management. So being able to create, load and save uh, prompt templates context length validation. So every LLM has its own kind of uh, context length uh, window limit. Um, data chunking. Uh, so anytime you're indexing data into vector search database, uh, you need to make sure that uh, your chunks make sense uh, semantically. Uh, we've got conversation memory. So persisting and ongoing uh, conversation with an LLM to memory and then kind of picking it up and revisiting it later. Um, so you could see that LangChain RB lets you use any sort of vector search database with um, any uh, matching uh, LLM. So for example, you could take Milvus and you could use Anthropic for embeddings or Google Palm for embeddings or OpenAI, of course. Um, some of the advantages behind this approach is that it offers a, a common uh, do domain specific language or common set of APIs. So because of that, you have interoperability. So if you want to switch out from OpenAI to, uh, uh, to Google Palm or Claude 2 from Anthropic or um, you know, any, any, uh, any other emergent uh, LLMs uh, or use an open source LLM, use uh, Llama 2, for example, you can. Um, so because of that, there's a reduced vendor lock-in. Um, you've got optionality because of that. Um, and again, we uh, try to enforce the best practices, which we try to be a little bit opinionated with Link Gen RB so that, um, uh, so you don't have to make those uh, minor minor decisions at every uh, at every fork along the way. Um, so let's dive into some code. So how would you execute vector search with let's say 
Milvus as your vector search database and Google Palm as a, as your uh, foundational model. Uh, so you would instantiate your LLM here, uh, just merely pass it an API key. Uh, you would create a client uh, using the Milvus, uh, Milvus uh, Ruby gem, uh, pass it the, the URL where your uh, Milvus instance is running, name the index, pass uh, pass the LLM in the, uh, instance. Um, and now you're ready to start uh, indexing data. So you could either call add text and just pass an array of different texts and corresponding IDs, uh, or you could send it files that Linkchain RB will actually load, parse, uh, and index into Milvus. Um, if you're familiar with Active Record, which is um, uh, an ORM in the Rails world, uh, you could accomplish the same thing in, in a lot fewer lines of code. So in your active record model, so for example, this one is called product uh, on top of a product table, database table. Um, you would declare your vector search. And uh, again, in this case, we're using Milvus here. Um, and then you would set up hooks so that whenever that record in the database is being operated on, uh, for example, MySQL or Postgres, uh, we would also generate embeddings and update uh, that record in Milvus. So you could see that we will upsert to our vector search, um, and in this case, Milvus. Um, and once you've done that, once you have some data in your, in your Milvus database, um, uh, you can start executing similarity searches. Um, so you could do a simple... Uh, Client.similarity search, pass in your query, or you could do QA style querying based on the question passed in. So let's take a look at the demo. So you can see that I'm instantiating the Milvus client, I'm creating the default schema, creating the default index. Um, I'm loading that default schema into memory. Um, and I should mention in uh, in this video, I have uh, Milvus uh, running uh, in, in Docker in a separate tab locally. Uh, so I'm actually pointing it to uh, import a benefits brochure. Um, your company, for example, your company's benefits brochure. And then we're just gonna go ahead and add that to, to Milvus. Uh, and I'm just going to scroll ahead a little bit. And now that that data has been indexed, uh, that uh, benefits brochure PDF has been uh, loaded, parsed, indexed into Milvus, I can now do Q&A style uh, question and answering on top of my corporate data. So for example, you can see I'm asking, what is the vacation policy? How much time can I take off? The company's vacation policy allows employees to take any reasonable amount of time off with pay. Um, what are all the benefits offered? The benefits offered are paid time off, sick leave, paid, paid holidays, et cetera. Tell me about the 401k benefits of the company. Uh, and you've got options such as Roth uh, or standard 401k. Yeah, trad traditional and Roth 401k. What are, all, what are the official uh, observed holidays? and you get an answer back. So, um, let's see. So what we were just doing in that demo, we were doing retrieval augmented generation. Um, and uh, what it is, is retrieving data from outside the foundation model and augmenting a prompt by adding a retrieved data into the context. So. Um, whenever a user's question would come in, uh, we generate an embedding vector from that user's question. Uh, we run a similarity search against the data in our vector search DB. Um, again, we were using Milvus. Um, and then we take those matches, we put them as a context into the prompt and then prompt the LLM to generate a coherent answer. And this is, uh, this is the actual prompt that we were using. Uh, so let's talk about agents. So agents are autonomous uh, general purpose LLM powered programs. Um, there's 
tons of emergent research, uh, such as chain of thought, tree of thought, uh, uh, reasoning plus act, react, etc. Um, and they can be used to automate workflows or execute multi-step uh, tasks. They work better with powerful LLMs. So for example, Claude, OpenAI, uh, Google Bard, um, I haven't actually tried it with Llama 2 yet. Um, and they're usually built by caref with carefully engineered prompts. Um, there is a need for uh, uh, for careful error handling and, and constraints for, for resiliency. Um, and they can also use tools, which are basically um, uh, API wrappers. They're kind of similar to OpenAI plugins. So some of the tools we have available and it's really easy to extend and add new ones are, are the calculator, the Wikipedia API, the Google search API, the weather API. Um, you can also interface with your own database. Um, so I'll give another uh, quick demo here. <clears throat> so again, we're using Langchain RB here in, in a uh, local uh, REPL session. So we're going to instantiate the weather tool um, and we're using this outside service. We're using the Ruby code interpreter tool. Uh, we're using a Google search tool. And again, we're using an outside service to, to do that again. Uh, the calculator tool. We're going to use the OpenAI LLM in this case. And uh, we're going to instantiate our React agent. Uh, so we're passing it the LLM, uh, in this case, the OpenAI, and the list of tools. So we've got the weather tool, the Google search tool, the Ruby code interpreter tool, and the calculator tool. And the first thing we're going to ask is we're going to task it and say, find the current weather in Boston, Massachusetts, and Washington, D.C., and take an average. Um, and what it does is it sends the original prompt to the OpenAI. OpenAI says, okay, well, I need to go and find the current weather in Boston, Massachusetts right now. So um, we recognize that we execute the, the weather uh, API. We fetch the, the, the current weather in Boston, Massachusetts. We send it back to the LLM. Uh, the LLM says, okay, well, now I need to know the weather in Washington, DC. So we repeat that, we send, a uh, an API called uh, to the weather API. We fetch the current weather in Washington, DC. And then lastly, the LLM says, okay, well, now I need to use the calculator uh, tool um, with these inputs, the, the current weather in Boston, the current weather in Washington, DC, um, and divide, uh, divide by two. And you can see it comes back with a final answer, which is the current, uh, the average current weather, I'm sorry, uh, the average current temperature in Boston, Massachusetts, and Washington, D.C. is 84 degrees Fahrenheit. So the next question we're going to ask it is we're going to say, what is the current uh, ruble USD exchange rate? So remember that we're using uh, OpenAI and um, uh, OpenAI has only been trained to uh, to data up to um, I, I believe mid twenty twenty one, so it, it has no clue about what the current uh, exchange rates are. So in order to fulfill uh, or answer this question, it needs to do a Google search, uh, and we need to find what the current exchange rate is. So. When we send this question to the LLM, it says, okay, well, I need to go and do a Google search for this. Uh, we execute that API call on the LLM's behalf, send back the result to the LLM, and it's able to synthesize an answer, generate an answer. Um, and lastly, we ask it to uh, use a Ruby program to output the sum of Fibonacci of this Fibonacci sequence for one through 1000 and not to, and we instructed not to define any Ruby methods. So it comes back with this code. Uh, this is a range. Uh, and we use the Ruby code interpreter tool to execute this Ruby code and send it back the answer and it's able to put it in, in natural language. Uh, the next 
agent I want to show you is the SQL query agent. Uh, and in this case, we're going to use a database which is running locally, which is a uh, Postgres instance. Uh, and it's a sample database and it, it is a e-learning platform. So we have students, uh, which is in the users table. Uh, we have courses, which is in the courses table. And also whenever students uh, complete courses, they receive certificates, which is in the certificates database table. Um, so, we in, so we instantiate the database tool. Again, in this case, we're using the OpenAI LLM. We're instantiating the agent. Uh, the SQL query agent, we're passing it the uh, LLM instance and the database tool. And we ask it, uh, the first question that we're gonna, uh, the first task that we're gonna um, impose to the agent uh, or we're, we're gonna ask the agent is we're gonna ask it how many users are there and the LLM will convert um, this question, natural language question, to a corresponding SQL query. So it will say that the proper query to answer this question is select count star from users. Uh, and then we will use the database tool to execute this query and then send back the answer uh, to the LLM. Um, and, then the and then the LLM generates a final answer, which is there are uh, 2,589 users, which is correct. So the next question that we are gonna ask it is how many users have completed all four courses? Uh, and the LLM looks at that question and says, well, in order to answer this, given the database schema, um, this is the query that you need to run. So select count star from users, enter join with certificates where certificates complete equals true. We take our query, we execute it on the LLM's behalf, send it back the answer, uh, and the LLM comes back with 160 users have completed all four courses. Um, and this uh, concludes the LangChain RV part. Uh, so. Um, this is our Discord. Um, we're very open to any kind of feedback, um, any kind of new ideas, how to improve the tools. Um, and we would just love to hear what everyone else uh, is doing in the space, uh, especially if you're using Ruby. Uh, so please, uh, if you get a chance, please, please do join in. Um, and that concludes uh, uh, our session. Thanks for such a, a great um, overview of, of Langchain and Ruby and what you can do with the, the Langchain Ruby client already. Um, I'm going to let other people ask questions, but if it doesn't look like uh, we have any open questions at the moment, um, I someone, I saw that uh, Shankar asked about, can we use Spring Boot JPA for connecting to Milvis similar to Ruby? Um, I think you can. We have a Java client. So I dropped the Java client in there. Um, and if that helps you, please, you know, let us know. Uh, if that's not what you're looking for, um, you know, feel free to feel free to ask. Um, but I, I I already find your your Langchain Ruby demo to be more smoother than my actual Python Langchain experience. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of want to know, like, you know. Uh, what is your kind of take on how you want to see Langchain Ruby involve, uh, evolve? Um, that's a very good question. Um, you know, I think, I think we're, I think we're trying to avoid building tools for, uh, for the tool's sake, um, and, and right. have everything rooted in real world use cases. Um, so, uh, we're constantly trying to solicit, solicit feedback here. Um, you know, you can, you could kind of, um, you can read some anecdotal data on, on Hacker News and Reddit and Twitter, other places that, um, people do struggle, um, in the Python world, people do struggle with some of these frameworks. 
um, yeah. and understanding in understanding the concept. Um, I think, I think Ruby, like I mentioned, I mentioned uh, kind of pragmatic driven development uh, sure, yeah. before. Um, and I think the community really has a chance here to bring those uh, bring those values into AI development as well, um, and and avoid avoid reinventing the wheel. For sure, um, man. I, I we're also we're also trying to build a much um, much tighter integration with Rails so okay. that it's. I don't want to say plug and play, but it's as close as as, as close as possible. So yeah. because <laughs> uh, because I think um, I think definitely this year um, with with this AI wave, um, all of the product managers are coming to their engineering leads and and uh, engineering leadership and are and are saying, okay, we know these capabilities exist. We would like to add these capabilities uh, to to our existing products. How do we do it, right? Yeah. And how much is it going to cost? How long is it going to take, right? And what are the trade offs? So, um, so we believe for uh, Ruby Rails shops, uh, we would like this to be kind of the the, the default solution. Cool. Um, Santiago has asked: uh, Is the idea that Langchain.rb follows the Python JS implementation as if the Python JS implementation is like, like the standard implementation? Uh, in terms of the API or features provided, or um, have you diverged from the current lane chain implementation uh, already, or is that going to happen? So I would say um, it's inspired by lane chain. Obviously, it carries a similar name, um, but it 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 has diverged a bit. Well, and and this is and this about... is mostly yeah, and this is this is mostly just due to the just due to the ecosystem and differences in the in the language and, and how we develop applications in, in Python versus in, in, in Ruby. Cool. Um, I also, uh, so Emily actually has a question, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask a follow-up question to what you just said first, um, which is how do you see Langchain.rb fit into the, the ecosystem of like working with your LLMs, working with your data? Um, because I think one thing that I see a lot with Langchain, uh, at least in, in Python, is that um, it is kind of positioned and framed as this way to chain together different ways to interact with your LLM, and it doesn't provide as much resources to work with your data. Um, so I wanted to get your thoughts on that and how important that would be uh, to Langchain RB. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're trying to focus on uh, a lot fewer... Um use cases. So I, I did show agents, uh, but on, on every slide, I said it was experimental because it's it's very difficult to get them to work really, really well. Yeah. Right? So um, the use cases that I presented were vector search, QA over your data, chatbots, and and that's also the order of our focus, right? So we want to we wanna make sure that if you're building vector search, uh, within the Ruby stack, it's 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 an end-to-end -end experience, right? So you're just pointing to a directory or a data source where your files or your data is is located, structured or unstructured, and we take care of the rest, right? You just need to make a decision whether you're gonna uh, pay your money to OpenAI or uh, to Google Palm, and whether you're gonna uh, pay pay Milvis or Zillis or someone else, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So you pick you pick your you pick your LLM, you pick your vector search database. Uh we take care of the rest, right? It's 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 plug and play. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Very, very cool. So it sounds like you're gonna be able to work you're kind of aiming to work with not just the data, I mean not just the LLMs, but also like the data as well. And the agents play is more of like something that's experimental because it's like not something that is uh yet standardized, nor is it something that we know a lot about. Um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how many, I'm not sure how many companies actually have, uh, agents, AI agents running in production. Like yeah. the, the, the research is constantly evolving. I mean, every, every couple of days there's a new paper. So I think, I think eventually we will get there, uh, where AI agents are a lot more reliable. 
Um, but that's, you know, that's not what we're currently uh, betting on. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Emily asked, what other tools need to be created in Ruby to fully take advantage of LLMs? Uh, that's a good question. Um, there are uh, there are a lot of uh, great foundational libraries in Python. Um, I don't, you know, I don't want to suggest that we, we we should just recreate them in Ruby. Um, again, even even with, with Langchain RB, we're we're putting a a Ruby spin uh, uh, on the on the Langchain project, right? It's it's a Ruby flavored uh, Langchain. Ruby flavored. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, but I. But I, I think we, we we will eventually find ourselves that uh, some 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 of those foundational libraries uh, do need to exist in Ruby. Um, yeah, that I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Diego has asked, have you contacted Langchain.com team to sync implementations and or make the project part of the official system, official ecosystem? Uh, we we do have a Langchain RB uh, channel on on the Langchain Discord. Um, I've had a couple of conversations with with Harrison, but uh, we've we've we, we've never uh, discussed anything 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 further. Well, do you want to talk about uh, why or why not you would um, you know integrate with um, the other link chain project, or even if you kind of see this as like a is this like a you know I know you said this is kind of like link chain with a Ruby flavor, but really you know someone asked if if you've kind of spun off from the uh, the way they've uh, you know created link chain Python link chain JS, and um, if this is something that may not even be called link chain uh, as you as you grow it. Yeah, uh, I um, I, so I don't. I don't. I don't think it's a zero sum game. I don't necessarily think we're. Um, if if you're using Python day to day and you love Python, then yeah, you should go with either Llama Index or or the the link chain Python implementation. Um, I do, however, uh, uh, I do, however, hear that longtime Ruby developers try out Python and it just doesn't feel the same. It's well, yeah, it's it's, it's close, crazy. but it. It doesn't. It doesn't hit the spot. Um, so, in that case, I think Langchain RB is 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 a great option. Um, cool. Yeah. Do you think? Or I guess this is this is a. I don't know. Um, this is less of a technical question and more of just like a, a curious question. Is do you think that um, that the adoption for Langchain RB is going to be uh, mainly done by like Ruby Ruby shops or hobbyists. Um, I don't see any reason why Ruby shops wouldn't adopt this tool. So if, I'm just, if, I'm just if, curious, if, like if, what, if, you, what your thoughts are on 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 like the expansion. Um. Well, the hope is definitely that big Ruby shops would also. Um, I don't want to say back, but. Um, the hope is that the big Ruby shops do adopt this tool, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, obviously, it, it it has to be a good tool, which which again uh, circles back to to the whole feedback loop. Uh, we don't want to be building uh, Langchain RB for made up uh, invented use cases, right? right? It needs right. to be. It needs to address. Um, the small shops, the big shops, and also the the enterprises using Ruby. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, Langchain Python was adopted through hobbyists, so I was just kind of curious what your thoughts are on that. Um, I think, Lynn, oh. yeah, I was just gonna say. I mean, it definitely starts like any big project starts with a POC, yeah. um, and if we can, uh, and if we can make that as seamless as possible, I think it's a good uh, it's a good entryway. Yeah. Um, Landon has asked, what made you make a link chain implementation versus using um, PyCall and are there limits to the PyCall approach? Also, I'm a huge fan of the good work you're doing. You got another fan, Andre. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, so, hey, Landon, thank you for, for joining. Um, actually, he's got a great, uh, he's got a great RailsConf talk 
Uh, oh, cool. That uh, Ruby in a- AI and Ruby. Um, I, I believe that he gave at a, at a Rails conf last year. So it's it's on YouTube. Definitely check it out. It's a great talk. Um, so I um, I gave PyCall a quick spin. Um, you know, it's still I'm I, I'm not um, um, I, I'm not a fan of those I, of of those ideas where one language is 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 converted into uh, into a different one. So, like I know in the uh, in the Rails world, we had those projects where you can compile Ruby uh, into client facing JavaScript code, and it just it sounds like a great idea because you know who like we all love writing Ruby and uh, not so much when it comes to JavaScript, <laughs> um, but it just never worked that well in practice. Um, so that's my, that's my kind of um, opinion to t- take on those types of projects. Um, and again, I think, I think if you have an existing Ruby project uh, and you want to add LLM capabilities to your existing project, you're basically trying to decide if we give something like Langchain RB a try, and we stay, uh, we stay within the same language, right? Like I, I, I keep stressing the monolith approach. Um, so you drop a gem, and you're still in the Ruby environment, or you spin up a separate service, which is a Python container, right? And now, um, and now, as an engineering leader, you need to decide. Um, do you have capabilities to uh, to be able to, to add another language into the mix, right? So it's a it's a separate it's a separate container. Um, you need to um, make sure you have staff um, that knows Python and knows how to operate that and scale and etc. Um, I also okay. So I have a, I have a, I have another question out of curiosity. I don't think there's any open questions right now. Okay, cool. Um, so when you were using Ruby Langchain, uh, is the computation being done server side or client side? Uh, what kind of computation? Well, you mean like, like generating generating embeddings? So let's say we're going to go call like the API. We're going to call an agent, and I wanted to like form my SQL query and then like do a SQL you know query. Um, is this all like, uh, is this done client side, server side? Like, are you calling? So, okay, I, I may not, I just might, I might just not understand how Ruby like monoliths work, but like the way that I kind of like envision this in my head, right, is like typically I see a difference between front end or like, you know, client side and then back end or like server side. And typically I see everything being implemented on server side and client side making like these API calls, right? Um, mm-hmm. So I just, I was just curious like how Langchain RB does that. Or if, if if Ruby on Rails is actually the server side, then 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 you know then obviously that makes a lot of sense. But I don't have a very comprehensive uh, grasp of Ruby. Yeah, um, well, Rails is Rails is a web development framework, right? So you can you, you can build the UI if you want with Rails. Um, you know, a lot of people opt out to opt in into building a, a React front end, right? And Rails okay. just becomes becomes an API that uh, your React project. Uh, talks with so um Langchain rb currently doesn't have a ui layers right so it doesn't it doesn't have a presentation layer so all of the demos that i did were uh in a console uh, so it runs on the back end okay cool it yeah, runs was... on the server yeah okay yeah i was just curious how that worked because i was like because as you were explaining i was like oh this is really interesting like how does that work um so we don't have any open questions i think we can let this sit for let's say a minute or so, and then and we can pass it uh, back on to, we can pass it back to Emily to, to wrap things up. Um, yeah, in the meantime, I just want to say, like, I think that, uh, I mean, A, I, I think that your initiative in creating this is pretty freaking awesome. And uh, I'm really impressed and I, I like what you're doing. And I'm really excited to kind of like stay up to date with, with how this progresses. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a pleasure. Um, you know, vector search tends tends to be a little bit complicated. So even even just seeing you and hearing you rehash through those concepts, I'm like, okay, back to the fundamentals, back to the fundamentals. Um, and and certainly, uh, thank you to all of the participants that uh, decided to take some time out of your day and and tune in. Uh, please do reach out 
uh, either to me or Eugen or Emily for any and all reasons. Um, uh, to, to me via Twitter or LinkedIn or uh, or create an issue in in, in the LinkedIn RB um, repo directly. Thank you. Andre, Eugen, thank you so much for this great session. I think we'll leave it here today. Um, so thank you. We hope to see you on a future Zillow's webinar and we'll send out um, some links to to get involved uh, that Andre mentioned on the call today in the email with the webinar recap. So thank you both for the time in this great session and we will see you all next time. Thanks.